songs. They were, they were really great. Really, really good. Especially that one I didn't know. That was, that was good. I like listening to it. <laughs> Uh, well, we're coming near the end of our sermon series here, and uh, Nate did a great job this morning talking about how we should be lights, and I'm sure Zach, as he finishes this series off, will do an excellent job next Sunday. I hope you can be here next Sunday for that, because I just love coming here together to worship, to worship God, and to be here with each other, and to dive into God's Word. We're going to do that. Look at Psalm 106. Psalm 106 and Matthew 26. Those are our main passages this evening, Psalm 106 and Matthew 26. Tonight we're talking about a very common human experience, something that we all have felt, and that is pain. I know school has just started, so there's a lot of kids out there that are probably experiencing pain, but on a more serious note, the first thing we have to understand when it comes to pain is that God is good. And that's the only way that we can tackle the struggles and the difficulties in a lasting and fruitful way. We cannot look at the world and all the pain and all the suffering and and not see that and, and really view it in an inappropriate way and not know that God is a good God, that God is a force for what is good. Knowing that God is good gives us an understanding of where goodness comes from. And that's going to be an aspect that heals our pain, is God's goodness. But if we don't think that God is good, if we don't even know God, then we don't know how to heal. We don't know where good comes from. And I want to make this clear, too. When I say that God is good, I'm not saying that he's good in the sense that everything's working out for me and my benefit good. We will have those days, those good days where everything works out for us. But his goodness is beyond that. It's way beyond that. It's, it's more than what we can even fathom, really. We will have, quote, good days and bad days, but that doesn't determine God's character. He is always good. He is our source of life. He is our source of what is good. And so we go into Psalm 106 and read with me verses 1 through 5, the powerful words by, this, by the person who wrote this. It says, Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for what? For he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Who can utter the mighty deeds of the Lord or declare all his praise? Blessed are they who observe justice, who do righteousness at all times. Remember me, O Lord, when you show favor to your people. Help me when you save them. They may look upon the prosperity of your chosen ones. They may rejoice in the gladness of your nation. That I may glory in your inheritance. Reading that, that is how we should start our day every day, let alone this lesson is a reminder, verse 1, to praise God, to give thanks to him that he is a good God, that his love is everlasting, endures forever, that we practice righteousness. Why? Why? Because sometimes these are the very things that are hardest to remember when we're experiencing pain. We get in our own bubble, we think about ourselves, and yet these are the things that we need most when we're struggling. Why? Because we need God. He is our antidote to this, and we need him. Now, granted, we can remember God in our pain, but we have to fall. We can't. We have to be careful not to fall into this trap of remembering God only when we're in pain, and that comes with a lot of negativity. I don't know if I'm going to make it out of this. I don't think God can really help me, but I have no other choice. And yes, desperate times do call sometimes for desperate measures. But do we see the same characteristics in our prayers and our messages to God during those times? We're giving God the glory. We're praising Him, giving thanks, and having a gracious attitude. Because if God is an afterthought, it's almost always going to bring us a negative perspective if we just remember him for our pain and for our pain's sake. What's happening is we're really just focusing on our pain and not God at all because all we want is we just want to get rid of this pain and so we're not focusing on him. What we should be doing, we should be praying to him in our pain so that we draw closer to him. When it comes to our struggles, that's what we want to renew our thinking about is this idea of how we push through our pain, how we progress through. And verse 5 gives us a little idea. Verse 5, look at that again. The psalmist asks God for grace, for favor there in verse 4. He needs to be saved. God remembers him and he does three things. What does he do? He looks upon the prosperity or in Hebrew, that could be the good of your chosen ones. Some versions might say the good. Rejoice in the gladness of God's nation and give glory with God's inheritance. The writer of this psalm in the context is looking back in Israel's history and seeing 
that God delivers them and delivers them and continues to deliver them and remains faithful even when his people are not faithful. That's the type of God that we serve. I love verse 4, that when we're striving toward salvation, when we're striving toward Christ, it's not if God saves us, it's verse 4, when God saves us. We have to believe in that same promise that he will deliver us. He will deliver us from our sins right now, today, and he will deliver us from our pain, if not right now, for sure, in the life after this. Jesus practiced these things and he experienced pain. And we looked at that in Matthew 27 a few weeks ago and how people show prejudice and his pain on the cross. And now even that he shows, we look at Matthew 26 and he has that pain, but he still pushes through. So read with me verse 20, verse 36 of Matthew 26. It says, Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his, his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to the point of death. Remain here and watch with me. Many read that and we resonate with Jesus' pain there. We, that's why we hear these verses all the time. I'm not saying we resonate in the sense that Jesus is God and die on the cross and saving the world, but we experience those things. We can read verse 37 and where Jesus says that he became sorrowful and troubled and know that's a human experience. And yet, how many times can we read verse 38 and actually feel that? How many of us have felt sorrow deep within our soul? God never promised a pain-free experience in this life, but he did promise us deliverance, something better in God's presence after this life. And so you look at verse 37, those two words, sorrow and trouble. Other versions I like better say that he became anguished and distressed. And that word troubled or distressed is the lowest or the worst form of loathing the Greek language can express. So when the early Christians are listening to this and hearing this, they're picturing a heavy, heavy weight that's almost unbearable. And that is what Christ is going through here. And that's what we can experience at times as well. There's different levels of suffering, and we all know this. Anything from a toothache to something more serious, like, you know, I lost a loved one. It's a serious thing, and it can be very heavy on us. Jesus isn't just experiencing discomfort. He's experiencing serious anguish. And serious anguish is something that we have felt we should use as a tool. We should use it as a tool to be sensitive to other people's pain, not jaded by our experiences and then using it as an excuse to separate ourselves and disconnect ourselves from others. People are hurting, and we have to know that, that pain affects others and that people hurt, and we should be sensitive to that. And more often than not, than we realize, there's more hurting than we really realize, or to say. There's a lot, and we need to be sensitive to that. And so instead, what we should do is what the Psalms 106 says, we should look to the good and the prosperity of others. Because what do we do when we are going through hard times? We have a tendency to what? To really, when we feel bad, we want to make other people feel worse. And so we tear them down. It's not our mission to, to tear people down. It's our mission to build people up. What attitude did Jesus have? Look there at verse 38. In the midst of all this pain, he tells Peter, James, and John to remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little further, he threw himself down with his face to the ground and prayed, My Father, if possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. I love that there's teaching there, that Jesus is teaching them. He's still teaching them. And what seems to be just routine, yeah, I'm with Jesus, of course I'm going, I'm going to pray, but he's still teaching them. A piece of Jesus' focus, while in the midst of deep anguish, is on the good of his disciples here, his chosen one. He wants to see spiritual growth and companionship. That is a part of looking at the good of our brothers and our sisters is the unity that we're experiencing when facing struggles, that we can face these things together. I'm able to come together. I'm able to pray with my brothers and sisters. Now, they're sitting down. They're not supposed to. We know from a parallel passage that Jesus tells them what? When they came to this place, that's the garden, to pray that you may not enter into temptation. Jesus is looking out for their well-being. Jesus sees what is to come, hence his distress. He's, that's why he's feeling pain. But the disciples here, they're not in the same place Jesus is. They aren't experiencing that type of distress. And Jesus is saying, don't make yourselves too comfortable. Pray that you do not enter into temptation. Jesus is thinking not about his own pain and the suffering that he'll experience in the near future, 
but also about their well-being and the spiritual health of his friends. And I say friends because that's what he calls Judas in verse 50, and we'll look at that in a second. But think about pain for a moment. How often do we allow pain to blind us and disconnect ourselves from others? If we're leaning into God or we're leaning into his goodness, we should be using our pain to motivate those that may be weaker in faith. Because if we are able to look at the good in a moment, then we're able to see that God is using that moment of pain in our life as an example to strengthen those that are around us, to build each other up, to lift each other up. And so we have to ask, when we see people who may not be in the same boat, who may not be suffering, how do we view them? Are we viewing them as an enemy, as a nuisance, as someone who's just annoying, or as a friend? And what does Jesus say in verse 47 through 50? Read with me. While he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. And now the betrayer, Judas, had given them a sign saying, The one I will kiss is the man, seize him. And he came up to Jesus and at once said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. And Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you came to do. And then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. No one would consider Judas to be a friend at that moment. You read that and many people would see him as an enemy. You just betrayed me. Why would I call you a friend? Do you see how much, how hard it is and how courageous it is to just look at someone you've been close to for so long and then see him betray you and then look at him and call him a friend? I think sometimes we make the mistake of of forgetting who our enemy really is, and so we blame other people, or we go to the extreme, and we blame God, when really our enemy is Satan, and he will use people. Whether they know they're working for Satan or not, he will use people. Satan wants to destroy us, and he wants to use people to distract us from him tearing us down, just like he wants to destroy Jesus. And everyone else before Jesus who were faithful, we read that in Hebrews 11. You look at examples of faithful people's lives, like like Job, you look at Abraham. You think about their lives and the pain and the struggling that they went through. What did they do? They pushed through that pain so that after that pain, they could look back and they could see what God did for them and the amazing things that God did for them. Pain is one of Satan's tools, and he will sometimes use people to execute that hurt. In fact, he will use hurt people to hurt others. He wants us to focus on our pain in ourselves, not the good of others. In an interview the other day, I heard someone put it this way. I I thought it was really good. He says, you cannot be self-conscious and other conscious at the same time. You cannot be both. And I thought, well, that's a really good observation. So you apply that to Jesus here. Jesus is focused on himself. And in a sense, yes, he's aware of his suffering. That's how he's focusing on himself. But he's not self-conscious because we see him caring for the good of others, his disciples, and even those who are hurting him and laying hands on him and trying to arrest him and even go to the point of crucifying him. What does he tell his disciples? Pray that you do not enter into temptation. He doesn't want to see them fail. He doesn't want to see them go into pain, the fall into sin. He doesn't like to see us even suffer. And so in addition, the good of our brothers and our sisters that should rub rub off on us so they can build us up. And if we can push through our pain, it can lift them up as well. It should work together for God's glory. If we're just self-conscious, then what's going to happen is we're going to look at the good of everything, all the good, God's goodness and the good of his people, and just see it as a negative thing. And envy is going to grow in our heart. Let's use our pain for the building up of others, especially for God's people. We need to do the opposite of what the disciples did. Right? If we, that's the progress of pain. If we lean into God, we do what the disciples did not do. What the disciples do? Right? They, they fell asleep, if we continue reading in that passage. But what did Jesus tell them to do? To pray, to connect with him. Instead of falling asleep, in fact, Nate made this point this morning. I didn't know you'd make it. But we can fall asleep on God. We can fall asleep. In fact, life without God is that. It's sleeping. It's not going anywhere when we're sleeping. We can't do anything. We can't progress. We can't move forward. I know we're thinking, well, it's easy. It's easy to sleep on God in my pain because I don't want to experience pain anymore. I just want it to go away. But God has a better plan for us. 
God has something better for us. He wants us awake so that we can move forward. The building of God's people, the building up of God's people, is going to lead to the strength of his kingdom. And if we can overcome those challenges and the pain, it's only going to strengthen his kingdom even more. What does the psalmist say in Psalm 106, verse 5, that second aspect? I may rejoice in the gladness of your nation. It can be very hard to read Matthew 26 and see where is Jesus rejoicing here. Unless our view of joy is just jumping up and down in continual bliss. That's a joyful moment, maybe, but that's not joy itself. Joy and even anguish should not conflict with each other. I'm not saying you smile for 10 minutes and your pain will go away. But we have to understand what is the gladness of God's nation. God's nation, God's people are not meant to be some miserable existence. This was supposed to be true for the people of Israel, and it's still true for us today as God's people. God's people should be full of joy. We are rejoicing in God. It should take themselves outside of their own experience and their own pain into a new reality where God gives them a new life and a new purpose. So what is God's nation? Because before it was the church and the saints, it was the people of Israel. And before it was the people of Israel, it was God's promise. It was a simple promise. And what is Jesus living for? Look at the two prayers that Jesus gives in Matthew 26, 39 through 43. Matthew 26, 39. Look closely at the differences between these prayers. My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. Where is Jesus' focus in his prayers? Or he is human like, like we are in this moment. He doesn't want to experience anguish and distress and sorrow. None of us do. It's not fun to experience those things. Jesus though, could see where this is going. And, and that's us. We don't want to experience you know, joy in our pain. We don't want to go through that. But Jesus, even when he's grieving, is looking forward, looking at God's promises. He sees the kingdom. He sees what he's been preaching about, the parables that he's been talking on. And that's what keeps him going, knowing that he is living for God, the Father's will, and not his own fleshly will. In our pain, we are always so nearsighted. We don't allow ourselves to see the possibilities God may have for us. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, George, Jesus said you're not supposed to think into the future. In Matthew 6, 34, what does he say? Do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And that's true. These two ideas aren't conflicting. We should adhere to what Jesus is saying here. And looking toward the possibilities that God may have for us is not taking away from what Jesus is saying here. How do we look forward? But also not falling into this, in Satan's trap of this fantasy land. We look forward by trusting in God, by trusting in him. We lean into our pain, we lean in toward God, and we concern ourselves, yes, with today's troubles, trusting in God's promises for the future. What does Jesus say right above that in Matthew 6, 33? He says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Doing that is living for his will. Doing that is trusting in God, even amongst our suffering and looking forward to the possibilities of God and, and his people. If we can do that in our difficulties, when it even seems impossible, that is how we find joy. That's how we find gladness in God's nation, even when it's difficult, even when we're going through pain. Look at the two differences in the prayers there between verse 39 and 42. He says in verse 39, what does Jesus say? My father, if it be possible, he says, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. You know, in this prayer, there's a hint of if it's possible to accomplish what needs to be accomplished without pain, let's do that. But then you look at verse 42 and it says, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. So what, after about 10 minutes of praying, right? Oh, 15 minutes of praying? No, maybe 
an hour or two hours, if not more, by this time, by verse 42, he comes to the conclusion that it's God's will. That's the conclusion. There's no other way around it. It's God's will, not his own. And that goes right into what the psalmist was saying. The third point, Psalm 106, verse 5. I'll read verse 4 for context again so we remember. Remember me, O Lord, when you show favor to your people. Help me when you save them, that I may glory with your inheritance. The world should look at us and how we deal with pain and difficulties and know that there's something different that we're living for. There's something greater that we're living for. They should look at that more and the greater. That in their pain, they see that we are, we are not self-conscious. We are other-conscious. That we're not living in sin, trying to drown our sorrows. That we're rejoicing and we're living righteously. Why? Because we're seeking after His kingdom and His righteousness. Doing that gives God the glory. Giving something the glory, and again, Nate made this point again. I think he stole my notes. He, giving something the glory takes the attention off ourselves. At least it should. We shouldn't be lights in the sense that we grab people's attentions for the sake of ourselves. We should be reflecting, as Nate said, God's light on others. We should grab people's attentions for what, and more importantly, who we are living for. People need to see that, that what our life is all about, that it's about God and his will. Who is Jesus living for? Who is he following even to the point of death, even in his pain? God and God's will. Can we do the same? Can we say the same? Jesus is going through pain and going through anguish and sorrow, and the first thing he does is what? He falls on his face and he prays. He prays to God. I know there are a lot of us here today that are struggling, and what is the first thing that we should be doing? Who should we be living for? We cannot save ourselves. We cannot save ourselves from our pain. Only God can deliver us from the pain that is caused by living in this corrupt, sinful world. The thing is, we have to do as Jesus said in verse 41. It, the spirit indeed is willing, but what does he say? The flesh is weak. We're made of both. We're made of both. The question is, which one is going to overcome? Which one is going to overcome? It's the pounding pain of our flesh going to dictate how our spirit lives and how we live because our spirit is made for something more and if we should, should be striving for God. We need to be living by our spirit that should be powered by the Holy Spirit and moving forward toward eternal life. That is how we give glory to his inheritance. We do as Jesus did. We follow the will of God, not our own. Even in our pain, we follow God's will. God does not want to see us fail. He wants to see us with him after this life. He's not going to give us more pain than our faith can handle. And Chris Mills gave a great deal the other day. He told me the deal with Matthew 11.30, which you got a sneak peek of it, which says, Jesus says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Without God, our pain is very heavy. The world isn't saving us. The world doesn't care about us the way God and his people care about us. The pain that we experience without God, what it does is it drags us down and it keeps us down and it keeps us stuck. It keeps us, as some psalms say, in the mire, in the quicksand, in the mud, and we can't get out. And yet we have to ask, how are we going to allow pain to affect our life? Jesus says what there? My yoke is easy and my burden is light. I can move forward with that. I can move forward with that burden there. We can push through with God's strength and his righteousness. That means leaning into our pain, leaning into God and God's goodness. Again, we have to trust in God and that he has our future no matter what we're experiencing. We have to trust in God. The question is, how do we trust in God? Jesus in Matthew 11 says there that after he says his yoke is easy, right before that, he says in verse 27, all things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, anyone, and the Son, and anyone whom the Son chooses to reveal him. So how do we trust God? We strive to know who God is, which means we strive to know who Jesus is. And how do we know who Jesus is? The Son and, and who he reveals himself to. Jesus tells us what eternal life is. In John 17, verse 3, when he says, this is eternal life that you know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. God promised us eternal life. 
And that is God's inheritance that we need to give glory to, God that we need to give glory to. Giving attention to God's inheritance is going to help us focus not on our pain and our struggles, but on Him. Eternal life with God is a place where there is no pain and there is no struggles and suffering. With God, there is purpose and there's meaning. And that's even true for our daily lives right now. We can have purpose and we can have meaning. We just have to have God in our life. We have to be seeking his kingdom and his righteousness. That is living for a good God. Jesus knew that this life was going to be tough, that there will be difficulties, and he comforts us in Matthew 11, verses 28 through 29, when he says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest in your souls. To think about that for a second, that idea of rest should comfort us. In fact, if you look back in Psalms, in that verse 5 there, Psalm 106, verse 5, something I, I noticed there, that it says, that I may look upon the prosperity of your chosen ones, that I may rejoice in the gladness of your nation, that I may glory with your inheritance. It's God's chosen ones, it's God's nation, it's God's inheritance, it's all God's. Who have we given our life to? That's the question that we have to ask. I hope and I pray it's God. That's going to help us get through our pain. If there's anyone that is experiencing pain and, and needs prayers, we love to pray for you. We're a praying family here. We collectively, individually, reach out to us. We'll pray for you. If there's those that are experiencing pain and need Jesus, you look at moments after he prayed in the garden, after he experienced anguish and sorrow and distress, he was what? He was beaten and whipped and nailed to the cross. He lived and he died for us so that we can learn from him, so that we can be perfect in God's sight. If we are going through pain, a life of for God changes how we look at struggles. It changes how we deal with challenges. Jesus changed our life. It can change your life as well. It starts with being baptized, washing away those sins that we know without God causes so much grief. And if that is you this evening, you want to be baptized, then come forward now.